Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including that Charlie dude, Justin Zellers, Pepper Giese, and Nathan Anderson. On this episode of DTNS, Michelle Rahman tells us why the Rabbit R1 could have been an app, but maybe it's better off as hardware, plus why GM continues to make its own infotainment system, and Eileen Rivera joins us to read the signs on what Apple might bring to its May 7th announcement. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 1st, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Eileen Rivera from Sawyer's House. And bidding farewell to the Aurora Borealis season, I'm Amos. Where does it go, Amos? It goes at south. the end of this. It does? It, goes it just goes hangs out in the summer. Oh, so Craig will see it down in Antarctica. Uh, yeah, because it goes from Aurora Borealis, meaning northern lights, to Aurora Australialis. Uh-huh. Australia, 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 yeah, Australia. yeah, yeah. meaning mm. southern lights. So easy yeah. for you to say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, May first is the official end of the season. We will not see it until late August again. Very good, very good. Is there anyone that would like me to start with the quick hits? Uh, I would. GoTo has finished spinning out LastPass into a separate company owned by a group called LMI Parent. Rolls right off the tongue. CEO Kareem Tuba will remain in his position under the new corporate structure. GoTo promised to spin out LastPass in December of 2021. So this was a long time coming. Meta announced Tuesday that Batman Arkham Shadow will be released as a VR game exclusive to the Meta Quest 3. Iron Man VR developer Camouflage and Oculus Studios are developing the game set for later this year. Uh, in 2016, you may remember Rocksteady Studios released Batman Arkham VR on the PlayStation VR before it ported it to other VR headsets. But kind of a big deal for Quest to get a big name exclusive like this. No word on who's going to voice Batman, though. Uh, sadly, Kevin Conroy, who previously did the voice in the series, passed away in 2022. OpenAI competitor Anthropic has released a mobile app version of its chatbot for iOS. The app can do chat and image analysis. Before this release, you could only interact at the website Claude, Claude with an e dot AI, or by accessing the model library directly. An Android version is coming soon, says the company. Mobile app is free to all users. Anthropic also added a new subscription tier called Team, which gives access to all Claude models for a group of five or more people, $30 per person per month. Walmart announced it's going to close its 51 health centers uh, that are available in five U.S. states. They started opening them up in 2019, so they haven't even been around five years. Along with that, it will also shut down its telehealth virtual care program. Uh, it started that when it acquired MeMD in 2021. Uh, though they announced the closures are coming, they did not give dates on when the services will shut down. TechCrunch's Sarah Perez reports that TikTok may be circumventing the App Store to avoid paying that 30% commission that Apple wants to take from developers. David Tesler tells TechCrunch that the feature may be hidden from most users, but he saw it, um, maybe hidden by design or because it's only shown to users in a specific group. Maybe they're testers, maybe they're people who have been known to spend money on the platform before. But for those who do have access, the new option uh, is seen a few different ways, basically encouraging them to recharge or, you know, basically put money in the tank at TikTok.com, at which point they're taken to TikTok.com slash coin. Also, a new Reuters and Ipsos poll shows that the majority of Americans believe that China uses TikTok to shape U.S. public opinion. Around 50% of respondents agreed that the Chinese government uses TikTok to influence American public opinion. 13% disagreed, with the rest either being unsure or not answering the question. All right, Android Faithful's Michelle Rahman discovered... A very interesting thing about a <laughs> oft talked about device as of late, the Rabbit R1 AI device. Tom spoke to him earlier about what is weird about it. The Rabbit R1 is a $199 device. You might remember they announced it at CES. It uses what they call a large action model, which is kind of like a large language model and some other tools uh, to let you do a lot of the things you would do on a smartphone, but with your voice. Michelle, you recently found out some interesting things about how how Rabbit works. What what did you find out? So, Tom, it's both interesting and also not interesting. For one, if you're at all familiar with like the landscape of you know device development and startup, like you really only have a few options when it comes to 
building an operating system for your bespoke hardware. And in this case, really, the best choice is Android because the the uh, chip, the CPU that is running on the Rabbit R1 is an off-the-shelf MediaTek chip that is also shipping on smartphones. And instead of reinventing the wheel and designing your entire op- your own operating system for it, they decided to just use AOSP, which is the open source version of Android. That part is not interesting. That part is not really surprising. But what is surprising is the the marketing and kind of the discourse around this device where, you know, Rabbit is saying this is a device that will replace apps on your phone, right? You don't need your phone and a whole bunch of different apps to do everything. When said, you can just have the Rabbit R1, use your voice, and it'll control things like calling an Uber, um, ordering food from DoorDash, uh, listening to the music from Spotify, talking to ChatGPT, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of users who are seeing this device, seeing the announcements on it, they're just asking themselves, why can't this just be itself an app on my phone? Well, the thing is, it kind of is because the Rabbit R1, as I've discovered, itself runs Android. It runs the open source version of Android 13. And the entire interface that you interact with, that whole setup process, the little home screen where you have a little Rabbit icon that you press down the button to talk to, the entire settings interface, all of that is a application called a launcher application. And I, someone sent that to me, a tipster via Telegram sent that launcher application to me, and I managed to sideload it onto my Google Pixel 6a and basically trick it into thinking that I was using a Rabbit R1 device when in fact I was using an Android phone. And this worked because the launcher, as I mentioned, is an Android application, and my Pixel 6a is an Android phone. So basically, this kind of answers the question, could it have been an app? The answer is yes. Now, I noticed one of the things in your article that you were careful to note is you didn't try launching Spotify and such with it because that does require a little more than just a launcher app, uh, especially when you're running it on a phone. Uh, And that should be important for people to hear, but it seems to have gotten a little lost in the reaction to this. So let let me clarify that bit a little bit. I kind of mentioned at the end there, I had to do some tinkering. I had to get some, the app requires some specialized privileges to run. Yeah, yeah. That's only true because the specialized privileges it needs are to do things like toggling your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi radio um, automatically. It needs to do things like access your device's unique identifier, like the IMEI number. These are things that on Android, you require privileged access to access these APIs. However, none of the permissions that the privileged permissions that this app needs are at all required for the core functionality of this device, which is accessing a large language model through a network call or interfacing with the Spotify um, Mm -hmm. API or any of the other stuff. None of those permissions are needed. So in fact, you could run this on an Android device with just the microphone, the camera permission, and um, just some of the regular standard Android permissions that any Android device can give. So I I don't think the reason that Spotify crashed is because it's not running on this bespoke R1 hardware. There's likely some other reason for that, but I don't think there's any reason why it wouldn't be able to work as an Android Yeah, you could could figure that out and and fix it. What was Rabbit's response to this? So their response is kind of centered around concern about how people see this article. They are basically concerned that people will see this article and misinterpret it to think that everything that they're doing is just in the form of an Android app. So basically their response is that the R1 is not just an Android app because there's also a cloud component where the large language model and the large action model are running. Well, our article never really put that in contention. It's clear from the get-go that your R1 device is the client to the cloud-based component. And what's actually running is just an Android app that acts as the client. So all the proprietary stuff they have in the back end, that's still there. That's still, you know, they to their credit, they design and develop this. But the actual service that's interacting with it doesn't have to be on this dedicated R1 hardware. It could have been an Android app shipped on Google Play if they had chosen to go that route. Now, I know this story has has kind of blown up uh, <laughs> and has, has caught a lot of people's intention, uh, attention. What real quickly do you think this the significance of this is? Is it just kind of a cool thing? I think the significance of this is kind of just revealing to the average user that a lot of these niche gadget AI startups are they're trying to they need something to stand out from the crowd. So 
if Rabbit were to ship this um, large action model as a standalone app on Google Play, there's a very high likelihood that almost nobody would use it or download it. Just just because there's so many other yeah. competitors out there in the landscape. But when you partner with Teenage Engineering, when you have this bespoke hardware that you can market and sell to users, then instead of shipping a, an app that you know would cost a multi-subscription or several dozens of dollars, um, you could have this single hardware that provides exclusive access to their model. And that's what they're marketing. This The Rabbit R1 makes their backend marketable. Without it, I don't think anyone would really care about yeah. this application. No, that's a really good point. Michelle, thanks so much uh, for taking time to, to walk us through all of this. Of course, uh, go read his article. You can find that at androidauthority.com. We'll have that linked in the show notes. Where else can uh, people keep up with what you do? You can also go to um, the another podcast that I co-host, Android Faithful, part of the DTNS network. And that's where I talk about um, Android Weekly with my fellow co-hosts, Ron, Wynn, and Jason. And if you want to support me personally, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Michelle Ramon, where, you know, it takes a lot of work to uncover and do what I do. So if you want to be part of the community and support that work, you can go there. Absolutely. Go support Michelle, especially today. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. He actually got the reaction from Rabbit live during Android Faithful on Tuesday. So if you haven't watched the show, you get, oh, you get really? a more in-depth explanation and you get to see him react to that uh, it, as he was getting it. It was pretty interesting. I mean, Michelle is good with the Android scoops these days. Uh, you know, the, the Rabbit R1, uh, curious little device. I had high hopes for it. Uh, got a lot of attention at CES. Um, it sounds like we're still in that period of people being like, but why? <laughs> you know, new form factor, but why? Yeah, it's got, it's like a Roku though. Like a Roku can be an app, but there's a reason for it to be a set top box or, or something. Mm, I think people mm -hmm. are still looking for that reason with the R1. Well, uh, moving on, just over a year ago, General Motors decided to move away from Apple CarPlay and also Android Auto and its vehicles, instead working on an alternative of its own where it had more control overall over the experience and data that it collects from users. GM's 2024 Chevrolet Blazer had the first glimpse at the company's efforts. The Ultify platform, an infotainment system built uh, in Red Hat Linux, looks a lot like CarPlay, if you can make a direct comparison, same idea anyway. The problem included how users can access new messages over Bluetooth, Ultify isn't able to ask Siri for directions to a location. You can still do that through Google Maps, it's one extra step. If you're used to doing something a certain way, it might seem a little, um, you know, a little clunky. No Apple Music, no podcast app either, because of course that's CarPlay stuff. Maybe you just get used to it. But a family with this new Blazer told Apple Insider that the system itself crashed to the point that they were without their vehicle for a month while the dealership tried to fix the system. They had gone on a road trip. They couldn't change the radio station. There were a myriad of sort of crashes and glitches. Enough people had similar issues that GM decided to halt sales of that car in December until it could fix the glitches. Now, Eileen, GM was worried that as CarPlay evolves, it was going to lose ever more control over its own vehicle experience and the ability to know things about uh, the people who are driving its vehicles. But as a driver, do we need that custom experience? I think that's kind of a tough sell these days. You know, I'm sympathetic with GM wanting to, you know, have their own custom experience, but bottom line, it has to work. <laughs> I mean, just based on the story alone from this family, it just seems like a horrible situation. And that's enough to be like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to get that car. Mm -hmm. So why not give an experience or options so that you can experience things like CarPlay along with whatever that they're, you know, uh, creating themselves, right? This ulti platform. So if you know me from Apple Vision Show, and I know Sarah knows me from Apple Vision Show, I am all about pro-consumer. So it has to work for the consumer. This is already bad news, right? So I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to buy a GM vehicle that has the ulti platform based on, on this. You don't want that kind of news. You want the news to be like, this is a great experience. This works. And you know what? If it's Apple or Android auto, I don't care. Just make it work for us. It's already hard enough, right? We yeah. need to be able I mean, to I, the case. car that I drive now is the first car that's ever supported CarPlay. Um, you know, I could, I could, 
plug in my phone and 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 have some Bluetooth capabilities. But this is, uh, you know, I've been using CarPlay every day for the most part for a number of years now. And, you know, in the rare occasion that I drive someone else's car that also supports CarPlay or maybe a rental car, I had, you know, I had a rental car uh, earlier this year um, or last year, uh, that, you know, that works great because for the most part, besides you being like, okay, where, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, where's my turn signal? Like everything right. is kind of the same. Yeah. Consumer wise, I mean, it's nice to have variety, but it's also really nice to have reliability. Exactly. Um, especially when you've got, yeah, you got your podcast, they're already in your phone. You, all you mm. have to do is connect the connect the phone. But, you know, as we were talking before the show, Tom, you reminded us that uh, these companies don't care about our comfort. I mean, they would like us to be comfortable when driving the cars, but uh, GM wants the data that Apple was going to be taking too much of. Yeah, I mean, this is not about what is the best experience for the driver as much as it is about what can I do with the data? So mm -hmm. the reason they got rid of CarPlay on GM wasn't because they didn't think CarPlay was a better experience. I'm sure they did, but Apple was presenting future versions of CarPlay as taking over more and more of the systems. And as Apple does, this is why you don't see Netflix integrated with a lot of Apple systems. When you integrate with Apple, they control the data. They keep the data. And one of the benefits of Apple is they keep the data more private than a lot of other places do. GM doesn't want that. GM wants to have all of that data about how many miles you're driving, how fast you're going, all of that stuff. And not because of insurance, that's a whole separate thing, but because they want to have that to be able to sell a car to you, sell features to you, accessories to you, and market their future cars as well. And they would be threatened from having that data if they let Apple take over more of the car. And so they decided, you know what, Until before it gets to that point, Let's just make our own version. Let's go through the pain and agony of having the bugs and the glitches and be able to improve it to the point that we've got something that will work in 2025, 2026, uh, which is kind of backwards. And instead of going from lots of operating systems like Commodore 64 and TI and then settling on, on Windows and Mac, we're going from Android and Apple and moving backwards into each car maker having its own operating system. And yeah, who the, the person who loses in the end is the consumer. Yeah. And that's why it's not okay. And I, again, like I said, I'm sympathetic to GM for, you know, those purposes and those needs. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, like who wants that? Who wants that aggravated experience at this point in time? Now, if it improves later, great, good for them. But you know, at this, I point, mean, the consumer doesn't know. want it. Um, yeah, you know, if, if if I think you know, if GM goes back to the drawing board or just says, okay, I guess we just deal with you know Apple and Android uh, Auto um, as as the best versions of this. It all depends on how many cars they're selling. Yeah. Right. No, GM GM right now is thinking like, this is how we learn. We'll improve it. It won't be buggy. We'll fix all this stuff. Uh, and you as a driver won't notice anymore. At least that that's what they're confident they can do. But, uh, you know, it turns out Apple and, and Google have a lot of engineers who've worked on this sort of thing for a long time. And CarPlay and Android Auto are great. It's going to take a while for each individual car maker to try to catch up with that. Uh, I'm not sure that GM is inspiring confidence in the other car makers to try. Yeah. Well, folks, uh, if you've got a thought on this, maybe you're like, no, I like the GM infotainment system. Uh, you can tell us in our Discord. A lot of great conversations go on in there. You can join it by linking to your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Apple's been promoting its May 7th Let Loose event, which happens in the morning instead of in the mid-morning. happens at 7 a.m. Pacific time, 10 a.m. Eastern time. It's been using the terms drafting up something special for you, which sounds like a pencil, right? We've seen other allusions to an Apple pencil. We're going to expect iPads. But they've also said it's going to be a different kind of Apple event. Now, that has taken a lot of people's attention to be like, well, what do you mean by that? Yeah, how different? Uh -huh. So I think it's going to be like Jimmy Fallon's, you know, thank you notes. So it's going to be Tim Cook. <laughs> and Apple is released with the, with the Apple Pencil, releasing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a new pencil that's happy and there is a you know i'm just that would be right different now, but like that would be different 
I just, when I heard that and, you know, the pencils being touted on the, uh, you know, the logo and everything, I literally was like, what is that segment that Jimmy Fallon does? And I was like, oh my yeah, gosh, yeah, that yeah. would be so funny if that was even a part of the Apple presentation. But I mean, I'm excited. I, I, I'm going to say this right now. I'm like, oh gosh, I hope I don't uh, really want to upgrade. But um, all of the rumors that are coming out about this uh, announcement, like, just give it to me already. Like, I, I, I know that they've done an announcement that was different in... Uh, um, Halloween last year. Yeah, um, yeah. This is, you know, the time change and everything. So I don't know. I mean, I just feel like we can expect the unexpected, but I think this is, um, I think it's going to resuscitate the life of the iPad. And I'm very excited to see that. I mean, Apple has, starting with, I can't remember exactly what event it was, you know, at the start of the pandemic where nobody was going to be in person anyway, where they had their first sort of uh, highly produced, you know, um, uh, drone mm. footage, you know, through the yeah. uh, the the um, the spaceship uh, campus, and you know, a lot of people were like, "Hmm, a little canned, but like actually kind of good," uh, yeah. because they they can really sort of control the message um, rather than you know this sort of big auditorium shot that we're all used to these these events being sort of looking the same. Okay, so that has and and Apple has continued that uh, over the years, um, and I, I actually prefer those events because I'm like, just just tell me what you want to mm -hmm. tell me in the way that you want to tell me. And then I can, you know, I can digest afterwards. But I'm like, OK, so if it was something different and we, we you know, the yeah, emphasis on the word draft, Apple Pencil, rumored to have haptic feedback that came from Mark Gurman over at Bloomberg, all of that is interesting. You know, what if it's just staged in some place that's like and like the jimmy fallon studio. thing right like it yeah. could be it could be an interesting demonstration maybe not the actual jimmy fallon thing but right but but doing some kind of different way of presentation and demonstration i also think we're going to get a lot of ai on device stuff with this yeah, ipad so there i was might be some say, of that i was going to say that perhaps the presentation is related to ai in a chatbot yeah. screen or something related with siri and it working a lot better and you're going to have some sort of AI, oh, like the AI, AI is let loose. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, you know? but obviously it tells you all the right things. Uh, but uh, yeah, that would be kind of cool. That would be kind of interesting. Huh. Yeah, I, th I think we're, we're triangulating in. Obviously, we'll find out uh, on May 7th. Uh, it is more interesting to speculate on on that than like, oh, it's going to be three versions of the iPad. It's like, well, yeah, we know. We haven't had an iPad in more than a year. So, of course, it's going to be new iPads, and they're going to have OLED screens. Uh, if, if they do something with AI and it's kind of whiz-bang and impressive, that'll be, that'll be more fun to talk about. I hope they do. Mm -hmm. Well, what may not be as fun uh, for you if you have an Apple Vision Pro is the resale value. <laughs> The Verge's Wes Davis wrote up a piece this past weekend titled, The Apple Vision Pro's eBay Prices Are Making Me Sad. In the piece, Davis details the steep devaluation, depending on, you know, where you're looking, between a new Apple Vision Pro and what they go for used. He notes he financed a 256 gigabyte Apple Vision Pro for $3,900 back in February, recently looked up prices for used Apple Vision Pros on eBay and reselling site Swappa. Uh, an Apple Vision Pro with similar specs to his purchase sold for $2,600. So you're looking at a markdown of $1,300. Davis, Davis acknowledges steep price drops are the price of being an early adopter. So this stuff happens, but it doesn't always happen. Um, so Eileen, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously you and I talk about the Apple Vision Pro on Apple Vision Show quite often, <laughs> as well as Apple products in general. But you know, when I first saw this headline, I thought, oh, gosh, what are the resale mm, values? It's yeah. not it's not as much of a price drop as I would have expected. Yeah. But definitely just goes to show you that if you're not a developer, um, you, you know, you you either need to have a pretty good use case for one of these things or you're you know, you might be unloading it. Yeah. And I mean, hey, consider this if you are curious and you want a discount instead of paying full price. I see one on here for fifteen hundred dollars right now. I'm like, OK, um, I, you know, devices, yeah. um, concert tickets, you know, uh, Funko Pops, all of this stuff, like, you know, the market value will change based on demand, obviously. Yeah, it's and, a fluctuating. Um, it yeah, really is. And, deal. you know, there are on eBay, there are even more expensive prices, like $5,000, uh, you know, on here for, you know, like a whole set. But, um, I mean, I don't... <laughs> 
I just consider this a win for the consumer if you're very curious and like, okay, you know, this this person doesn't want to work with it anymore, doesn't have a need, and maybe you should try it as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think it's anything to be like, oh, no, uh, nobody wants uh, this device anymore. I mean, it's too early to tell. It's only been a couple months, right? Yeah. So, are these are these prices that go up the longer they're listed too? Like, I guess on Swappa, it's not. So that one is clearly selling it for less than they paid for it. But but on eBay, a lot of these are not buy it now. They're like, oh, it's 2,500, but they're hoping that the bids keep going up, I guess. Right, yeah, yeah. that's true. Right, yeah, they're, they're um... I mean, yeah, but on a Swapa, lot of those this are too prices, is, so. huh. I, I mean, I know that uh, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, sit here and be like, oh, everybody wants a Vision Pro. I have no idea what's going on here. I mean, clearly some people are like, well, it's not for me, you know, so yeah. I wanna resell it. I also have bought, you know, open box electronics a mm -hmm. million times um, yep. for, you know, but from Best Buy or Amazon or what have you, because I'm just like, hey, I like a discount. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there there may have been and I, I mean, actually, I, I know there have been, but may, maybe more than I even realized people who just go, this is cool, but I'm just not shelling out that money. I'm going to wait a couple months and then buy it on the second exactly. market. Yeah, I mean, Nick bottom with a line. C, Nick with a C is asking, can you not get a full refund still? But I guess we're past the return date for most of these, right? Yeah, must be. I yeah. think we are. I think we are, what, 30, 60 days at best? So, yeah. I mean, again, like, it's just, it's nothing special. This stuff happens with all kinds of devices, phones, the watch, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, not a surprise that this is going to drop on eBay. If it was iPhone, Generation one at this point in its life cycle, I would guess, and I haven't looked, that it was still selling above retail at that point. But mm. Yeah, it is interesting to see Apple Vision Pro go into the normal used discount price cycle this quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all the more reason to save it then and then sell it when it becomes a collector's, a real collector's. Yeah, item. you got to hold like, on for five 10, years, 15 you know? years. Yeah. Appreciation. Yeah. So don't sell it, guys. How if much you're not is an Oculus it? Rift Gen 1 going for? That's. <laughs> That's the isn't, that, isn't that funny where it becomes like, this is cool and new. And then it's like, eh, it's not cool yep. and new anymore. You know, I'll exactly. just offload it. And then like, oh, remember when that was cool and new? Can't now it should anymore. go on my, you know, <laughs> the shelf behind me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's check out the mailbag. <sighs> let's do it. This one comes in from Rico. Hi, Rico, uh, who says on Tuesday's show, you were discussing the news that Instagram will try to feature smaller creators, among other things. That immediately made me think of my YouTube feed and how it now regularly peppers in some smaller YouTube channels. Uh, people with less than 1,000 subscribers, for example, in my feed. The content is hit and miss, says Rico. For the first time in a long time, I had to resort to the the thumbs down button. Nonetheless, I'm happy to support smaller creators. Who knows which one will explode in popularity and then I'll be able to activate that smug, I knew them, that YouTuber when they had less than 1,000 subscribers. Are other listeners also seeing smaller creators appear in their feeds? That's interesting. I, I haven't seen a lot. I've seen a little experimentation, but now I don't know if I've seen smaller creators. Eileen, have, have you? No, not really. But if you want to follow me, I'm a smaller creator on Instagram. I would love to be featured. <laughs> Just kidding, but not. Um, no, I haven't uh, seen that. Okay. I mean, you know, uh, in, in the community that I kind of run with, which is the K-pop community on, uh, on my second Instagram feed, I'm, I'm kind of still seeing some of the same creators, but I haven't really looked at the numbers. So I need to I need to look a little bit closer. Yeah, I haven't. I I don't spend enough time. I, I'm I'm really not a YouTube creator at all. Um, I you know I I'm over there purely for consumption here and there, so I haven't noticed. Um, on Instagram, I will say some of my because I I I supervise my dog's its Instagram account. Um, every so often, I'll look through the feed and be like, huh, just a bunch of. You know, just kind of different stuff here. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, that I I feel like that's maybe the company just you know pushing some yeah. buttons rather yeah. than you know doing something that's really designed to change my experience overall. Also, mm -hmm. I looked it up. An Oculus Rift that sold for three hundred ninety nine new is selling for a hundred eleven on eBay. So we're not oh, there yet. Hold on to the we're Oculus. Not there yet. Yeah. yeah. Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Uh, well, Eileen Rivera, uh, who I just saw, <laughs> 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 I 
because we do a daily, uh, I'm sorry, a, a weekly show. Daily mm -hmm. Tech News Show is daily. Apple Vision Show is weekly. Um, and you can uh, find out more about that at applevisionshow.com, which is super fun. We're really enjoying it. Uh, but as you mentioned, you're online in other places. Let folks know where they yeah. can keep up with the other stuff. Yeah, if you want to see my shenanigans talking about the K-pop industry, you can find me on Instagram.com slash face of E or on TikTok as well. So uh, I have a lot of fun there. Uh, just chatting up a whole new community that I've been kind of, uh, you know, a part of for the last like four years. So uh, that's a lot of fun. Other than that, I'm having a whole lot of fun with you, Sarah, on Apple Vision Show. And we will cover, you know, this amazing, mind blowing, crazy announcement on Tuesday. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yes. And for anybody who does uh, fo follow us uh, when we uh, stream our show live on Mondays, we are switching to Tuesday uh, next week um, because we want to have all that information fresh for your next episode. So thanks to everybody who has subscribed. Uh, tell a friend. Uh, all good stuff. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk about Hybe and Min Hee Jin. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is launching free puzzle games. Should the New York Times be scared? We'll Ooh. talk about it. But just a reminder, our show is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2800 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow, talking about why Europe might be falling behind in tech with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>